Hey guys, it's Josh Brown. You are about to watch the last uh, episode of The Compound that we filmed just as the world was coming to an end. It was me and my friend Brooke Hammerling, who is an absolute superstar in the world of um, public relations, corporate strategy, corporate vision. She knows everyone, super well connected all over Silicon Valley, uh, the New York media circles, etc. And Brooke and I had a really interesting conversation about her new project, um, which is called Pop Culture Monday. And it's a newsletter that Brooke is putting out to keep business leaders up to speed with what's happening in pop culture. So important these days that people who are leading teams of, of employees, dealing with customers, speaking publicly in the media, understand the zeitgeist, understand what's happening uh, in pop culture. And Brooke's newsletter does a really great job at that. She's also an absolute rock star. You're gonna love this interview. It's so funny to watch us talking literally days before New York City went into lockdown, um, but everything she said is still hyper relevant, so stick around. Hey, it's Downtown Josh Brown. I am here with Brooke Hammerling. Brooke is a strategic communications expert for tech and media. Yeah. Is that the right? Yeah. I got it? Exactly. Okay. Brooke has founded an advisory firm called The New New Thing. She's also the author and producer, I guess. The everything. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a one woman you're show. You're the everything of Pop Culture Mondays. Everybody who's cool in technology and media is reading this newsletter. It's on Medium. We're going to talk all about it. Stick around. We'll see what's going on. So first of all, um, you've been working in at the intersection of technology, startups, media, um, helping people tell their story in the industry for a long time, and you did it all. Oh my God, for a long time. I mean, I started in the communications business in 1996, and it was a very short uh, moment of time before I realized that the world of technology was calling to me. And San Francisco, 97, 98, it was sort of... It was of, all just starting. It was just starting. It was the world for which the, um, you know, the misfits were called to. And I was super, I was 100% a, a misfit. I didn't know necessarily where I fit in, but I knew that I didn't color within the lines. I always colored outside of the lines. And San Francisco, in the beginning of that dot-com world, and I was there even before it was this dot-com madness. I think my startup that I went to work at, we were the first company to sign a lease in Potrero Hill, which then became, you know, three times right. the amount of square foot after we moved in. And it just blew up. Okay. So we're going to get into brew in a second. Um, but you knew the founders of a lot of the biggest technology companies in the world when they were babies. When they were babies. Right. Yeah. And, but yeah. you were like instrumental, I feel like, for some of them, like telling them like, no, you don't even know how great you are. This is what you really do. Like, this is your real company. This is your story. Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, it was incredible to be in, it's, you know, stealing from Hamilton for a minute, but being in the room when it happened. And yeah. I, I, like, whether he wasn't in the room when it happened, but, um, or, or Burr wasn't, but I was in that room. I saw these guys, whether um, they, and they were mainly men, I have to say initially, and I'm so glad to see that change. But these, these what I would call boys, man boys, I mean, we were sitting there playing video games and eating pizza, and they are now, you know, some of the world's wealthiest people. Right. What I think I had um, that differentiated me from any other sort of person in comms at that time wasn't just the access, because I, I always think of Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers. It was really, it's about, it's about the perfect timing. It's about a lot of luck. It's about a lot. It's about access, and it's about a lot of hard work. And it's sort of right. all of those things came together. So, so you stood out in a sea of like these big agencies that were used to dealing with the CEO of. Quest toothpaste. Yeah, well, they weren't even dealing with them. They were and dealing with whoever even... was the head of comms who reported to the CMO, who reported so, to the... All right, so you're talking directly to a CEO. Directly. And it didn't matter. It was, you know, the founders found themselves wanting to really be involved with the storytelling, and they needed to have somebody, you know, a communications person used to, the old-fashioned, I'm not saying this is how it is anymore, but used to be that it, a, it was a, it, in a room like this, and it would be a very programmed meeting, and the reporter would be sitting here, and the client would be sitting here, and the PR person would be sitting here taking taking notes yeah. and saying, well, that's off the record. And that's I've, sort of about, I've seen that. that's about the extent so, of it. So you know why that resonates so much with me is because in all of finance and Wall Street, people like, people like who writes your tweets? I'm like, dude, it's me. They're like, wait, CEO of the firm and your 
communicating with the public. But there is a perfect example. But that's what people want your, now. Your tweets are so authentic. And that's what we've emerged to now, to today, to 2020. Authenticity stands out. You can't fake authenticity. So that's what I want to ask you. So when you see technology founders now, they seem to get that. They, like they, I'm not going to say they all look up to Elon Musk, who's extremely online. Yeah. They probably don't all want to be that extremely online, but like they're not afraid well, I mean, some can backfire, right? I mean, the Elon stuff you're stealing today with the Jack Dorsey, I'm going to live in Africa for three to six months. And, and now having, he has to fight a, a hedge fund. And now he has to fight a hedge fund. And today, I <laughs> think at that hedge fund. Morgan Stanley conference today without mentioning that yeah. hedge fund that he was, uh, you know, he had to go out and say, well, I didn't really, that's not what I meant. And now I have to rethink it because of the virus. So right. I think back in the day with Bruce started what we what we went out to do and we were, you know, one of very few people doing this was to be senior thinking strategists that work together with founder driven businesses of all shapes and sizes. I used to say that we love to take startups and help them become big brands and we liked to work with big companies and help them be more, more startup like. And that's the key. How do right. you make a company be more startup like? It goes back to authenticity. It goes back to just what getting, big company is doing that well right now. I wish I could say that they've learned. Like my dream would be like Facebook. Come on, it's so it's so obvious. This is in your wheelhouse. Get you back been, to uh, your roots. Get back to your roots. You have the ability it's to too be. Big. Can't to, do it. I know. It's well, I just big. don't think it's natural to them, right? Yeah. It's not natural to them. Food companies like the fast food chains right. and um, perfect example, right? Like Taco brands, Bell, all all of those things. Wendy's, but Tito's today. They seem to be fearless. The consumer brands. What did, so, what did, Tito, is, what did Tito's do? Somebody came out and said you could just use Tito's as hand sanitizer. There were some memes going around that said, like, here's a great. There's great examples of making sure you you're totally like getting the be bank best bang for your buck of your hand sanitizer and mix right. it with vodka, and it became this thing. And so, Tito's used that in real time as an incredible marketing initiative, um, and said, wait, wait, no, uh, warning, you cannot use our vodka. Is not a hand sanitizer. Don't yeah, use duh. it. It's not going right. to do anything. But you should drink it. Like that'll help. That'll right. Thing. And so it's become everywhere and everybody's tweeting the story and they took what could have been a negative, like, you know, don't use us, don't use us and turn it into a positive in real time. It goes back to that Oreo cookie in the, the half time. Dude, the of chicken sandwich wars this past fall, like Popeye's sales were up 40% in the quarter. Is that wild? From, from picking a fight with, who was it? Not Chick-fil-A, McDonald's. They picked a fight with somebody about their chicken sandwich. I don't yeah, even remember. I know. Doesn't even matter. I have to tell they you. They had I lines. Forever. And the chicken sandwich now is a phenomenon anybody is now jumping in on. And I think that's right. That I think started on Twitter. Consumer packaged goods. These companies are doing it so much better than the technology companies yeah. that were born into it. Which is it. so weird. Which is so weird. But I think they've done a remarkable job. And I talk about a lot about pop culture as well. And I think in pop culture, you're starting to see these things really resonate. And people are connecting to brands in a way like they feel very, very, it's very personal. And they're like, I'm rooting for you because right. you were so clever and how you presented that. So let's get into that. Like people look at like the most clever startup-y things. A lot of it is originating on YouTube or Instagram, but like Dollar Shave Club and Harry's and everyone sure. points to these and they're just like, that's what we want to do. Yeah. But then I'm kind of like, how many of theirs can, how many of those can there really be? The thing is you can't make a guaranteed hit, right? You can do it in a movie or a TV show or, or an album. Right. right. So it's good. There is for as many as your hits are going to be a gazillion more misses. And I will say, you know, <laughs> I see so many founders and their marketing people are like, we have the greatest thing ever. We want to show you. And I send, they send it to me and I'm like cringing my calf muscle tightens. Cause I'm like, it's not, what do they expect? They think you're going to be like, Whoa, this is going to be a viral sensation. Yeah, yeah. And what I also have to remind people and, and anybody listening to this that has a company is communications people. We're not fairies. We're not, we don't have pixie dust. We can't make magic happen. We have to start with something. We can't make fetch happen. <laughs> we can't make <laughs> fetch happen. But right. sometimes things just take, a, a, a viral um, uh, life of its own. I'll, I'll talk about this thing that I actually just told my friend who's on the board of Revlon. I said, 
this they, there's this um, hair product called uh, the Revlon One Step, which is like a hair dryer with a brush in it. And I said to her, with all seriousness, if you gave me choice where I had to live without the Revlon One Step or my iPhone, it would be a no-brainer. I'd <laughs> take the iPhone. Right. I can get texts and everything elsewhere. Really? So what happened is this Revlon One Step has been around apparently since the 70s, since the 70s. And it was just this innocuous product. It's like $20 at the time on Amazon at this point. A big hunk of plastic. I mean, it's like really cheap looking. And then it started to come on my radar on Twitter, this writer, Caroline Moss, who writes this, who has this um, uh, uh, newsletter about her favorite things that she's purchased and, and whatnot. And it made the list. And this was on, and she kept talking about how great her hair was. And this is in, in sort of correlation with people talking about this, S, this um, Dyson... Um, uh, hair wrap that's $700 for curling your hair. Right. So she's like, this is an amazing alternative and it's $30. But then it kept popping up. I kept seeing it. People kept posting pictures on it went on my Twitter timeline and on Instagram about their hair after using the Revlon One Step. Then it got into more, more, more social and blogs. And then I saw Vogue write about it. So I ended up going and buying it. I've never done that, and it's become... You like, got influenced. Oh, my God, but the it's influencer huge. influencer got but influenced. But their products, so now, the, the craziest thing is, obviously, the price has gone up quite a bit, but now Amazon is selling what people are mistakenly buying, the Amazon version, because it's the first one that pops up when you do a search. Not mistakenly. That's not how mistakenly. Amazon rolls. Mistakenly right. on our end, not mistakenly on Amazon's end. Right. Um, and it's just become a phenomenon. Okay, so that's how it happens, which I guess is a good segue for um, you're doing this Pop Culture Mondays newsletter. Oh, yes. It's on Medium. Mm -hmm. We're going to link to it. A million people are going to subscribe. I hope I get a million people. It's so really fun. I I guess you're trying to like let people know what's going on, but in a very pithy way, yeah, so they I, don't have to spend hours being so up to date. So it started with first of all, I was really fascinated by the newsletter, you know, sort of apocalypse. I mean, there's just everywhere. It's like as many yeah. podcasts as there are, there are newsletters, and I am dyslexic, and my dyslexia has been really, really, really important to me in my career, actually, and how I think of things and aesthetics play a part in it. And so when I read these newsletters, they all look the same. They're all great. I mean, some of my, my dearest friends have amazing newsletters, but I started to, my mind wanders. Like, every when everything is this formulaic sort of appearance, I... I start to wonder. It turns out a lot of people have that. That's why you know people yeah. look at it or they'll just read the first few sentences. Or they you can't get people to read it. past three sentences unless the first three sentences grab them. Right. And in fact, a very important CEO who I mentioned earlier in this um, said to me once, like, send me if, if there's an email to me that is more than three sentences, I do not read past it. Yeah. So tell me what you need in those three sentences. So sort of like that, um, I was looking at newsletters and I was thinking about how I wanted to approach it because I had some ideas on, on things I wanted to talk about. And I hadn't been because since I had brew and then I sold brew, I'd been so consumed with that. I didn't have time. Now I had a little bit of time and also I wanted to use that creativity a little bit. But I was also finding that I have... Due to my dyslexia, I do have this in, ridiculous ability to hold on to useless information and have, get really deep in Wait, it. Wait, you're and, blaming your dyslexia yeah, on that? Yeah, I'm totally. I think that my oh, brain okay. works like I can't solve a word problem, but you know, you want to talk about anything Kardashian, I can talk about like what products they use since the 90s. Okay. I can, it's ridiculous. And my friends who seemingly have like actual real lives and things to be worried about, um, will come to me and say, can you please tell me, like, what is this? I've just missed it. Or, like, because you enter into it and on Twitter or Instagram, and it, if you're not living it or you're not absorbing it, you're sort of entering midstream, you yeah. know, entering into the river, and the currents have already come by, and you can't figure out what's what and what's the latest. And now with their timelines, you see things eight hours or 30 minutes, that you can't figure it out. So I think it was, there were two sort of big trends that were happening around the time I decided to do this newsletter. One was the, the um, banana on the wall at the uh, Miami. Oh, at Art you know, Basel. At Art Basel. Yeah. Um, that was duct taped to the wall. And then the other what was... was it, $20 million banana or I something? I mean, it was, yeah, somewhere between 150000 and $150 million. I don't know. And yeah, what's different Somebody anymore? ate the banana, and then I... So there was that hole, and there was so many story arcs from there. 
And then there was Baby Yoda. And so that really... Which is my personal favorite. Com- like. And that's why Baby Yoda is my spirit animal yeah, yeah. For, the, for the newsletter. My friends were just like, is it... I haven't seen Mandalorian. I don't have Disney+. Plus. You don't or, even need to. Is it, is it Yoda? Is it Yoda as a baby? And I'm like, no, no. it's not even Yoda. And it's right. not even a baby. So I started to tell that. And my friends were asking me all around the same time. And I'm literally copying and pasting text to them. To the next, to the next. To the Here's next. what this means. Here's and, why people are sharing it. And I'm spending hours yeah, yeah. a day of like making sure my friends are on. They were not even on group message to make it easier. So I then said, should I just write this out? Would you guys like to see an email? And I sent an email to uh, like 30 of my friends. I said, how would you feel about like a roundup of the pop culture? I didn't even, and a lot of these people didn't know that I was a writer at heart. I don't even know if I knew, but they all said, yes, please, that would be great. That would just be exactly, I can't keep up. I feel constantly like I'm, Failing. I'm failing with my children because they know things that I don't know. Visco girls, for example. Right. I'm failing with my colleagues, the younger. Visco the, girls are like the girls that would shop at Delia's when we were kids. We were. They're Delia's girls. They're, totally. Yeah, hundred okay. percent. That's Got exactly. It. Right. I mean, I. I'm, See, I'm, I'm learning already. I, a core. I'm a Visco girl. So then, um, but people were finding. They said it would help me with my children. It would help me with my colleagues, the younger, the older. It would help so me. So that's with what my I want. Wait. So that's what I want to get into. Don't like. Isn't it so important for people that are in this world and building companies right now? Like, they don't need all the trivial, like, details, but, like, things are blowing up online. Yeah. Everyone's talking about them. Like, you kind of have to be in the conversation. You have to know. And that's what you're delivering. So what I did was I did a roundup. And I I take, it's got to be short. It's got to be visual, again, for me. And that's why I chose Medium, because... A, uh, going back to my dyslexia, but I will I will have so many errors when I publish something. If I did it in a newsletter and it was out in the world and I couldn't revise or edit, I would yeah. literally have an anxiety. So you call it a newsletter, but so it's, it's really, really a blog, blog and you can exactly. edit it. Exactly. I can edit it and it's visual and it's great, but I, and I make it short and sweet, sort of around eight topics um, and I'm playing with it. But, but for example, like Love is Blind. Have you seen the show? I have no, show? Right, but, but I read your thing right. on Monday so and now I, I have to watch it. I started talking about it last week by saying this is going to be the it's show everyone's talking about. Right. This reality dating show, theoretically bringing people together. They never see each other while they're dating in these pods. And then the premise is if in order to continue on in this show, you have to get engaged and then theoretically get married. But you, you uh, propose uh, before you see each other. I don't know other. if I'm watching it. Okay. It's hilarious. But I had this, this in like... I just knew based on what I was seeing in a little sort of smaller groups that this was going to turn into something. And it's become... It's a huge show. It's huge. And it's, you know, other than the coronavirus, it's dominating the social conversation. People love to hate it. They're like, this is the worst. I can't can't wait for season two. So, but those are things that people then feel like I feel so good about knowing like I'm sitting in a meeting with with you know the marketing team and so like I'm just saying what somebody has said to me and they bring up love is blind and I felt like I could contribute to the conversation okay so this is like it's almost like an anti-aging solution <laughs> that you're selling Which is, I'm trying to considering but, but, I'm almost 50. like most anti-aging products are um physical <laughs> you're almost selling like a mental anti-aging product where somebody who's like in their th- Late 30s or early 40s. I'm talking my own book here. Mid but, mid to late 40s. But like I don't. Book. Yeah, like I have employees who are in their 20s. I have clients right. who are in their 70s. 100. I have to kind of be able to talk to everybody. You have to be able to know both. Being able to communicate with people where you can relate to the 20 year olds and relate to the 70 year olds. So that's where I find myself in life, and so. I think what you're doing is awesome, and I think everyone should subscribe to it. Thank you. You're gonna keep going though, right? Yeah, I'm doing. I'm really enjoying it. Like I'm becoming like a blogger though. Like I make that coffee, like a huge. So you know what's gonna happen with you though? Like I feel like in six weeks you're gonna start selling coffee makers, and I'm gonna be like, oh shit, she's she's now she's in business. Oh, I mean, come on. If if an advertiser wants to pay me a gazillion dollars, that's what's gonna happen. But right now it's totally free, and it's meant to be fun, and it's pure, and I get to write about my friends. Too, because I'm not a journalist and I have I'm not taking ads money for anything. So if my friends are involved, like my friend Stacy Bendit, who is the founder and CEO of Alice and Olivia, which is actually just down Downstairs. the street here, yeah, yeah. Um, she got into an unbelievable uh, debate or not? She was attacked by the Steve Madden. 
who is the, you know... The Over what? So Steve Madden stole um, one of her uh, trademark copyrighted designs, a state's face. It's literally a design of her face that's on the Alice and Olivia products. And he's been using it in the Betsy Johnson um, brand that they own. And so there's been a lawsuit about it. And I get they ran into each other. And um, somehow some word started. To, she was very calm. She had her four-year-old daughter with her. And she and he came, comes up. Am I allowed to curse on here? Or yeah, I don't give a shit. So he says, he comes up and she's like, well, you stole my thing. It's trademarked. He was like, I didn't steal shit. Go, if you're going to be rude to me, go fuck yourself. And saying it and then Steve, said it again. Steve go Madden. The convicted felon. Ex, who spent time. ex best friend of uh, Jordan Belfort. Yeah, so, tough well, guy. yeah, tough guy. Right. Yelling at a young mother with her four year old daughter with her. Okay. And so, you put the, so I put that up. And I mean, a yeah, lot of so it, but it went viral. Like right when I, I knew it, I knew that Stacey had hit gold. Stacey stayed so calm. But you so, don't want to turn it into like a gossip column. Per I don't. Se. It was. Okay. It, so that's why it was like the reason why it was an important thing is it was more of a here's a woman taking a stand on this big, big, big conglomerate. This wasn't gossip. This ended yeah, up becoming. Madden is publicly traded. It was a big. big it's company. a business thing, and yeah. it was, and it was also a, a story of the time right now, and the women and old men coming after them, and their children there. And I just thought it was a very important. I mean, m movement, whether she was my friend or not, and to see how she handled it was also really, really extraordinary. All right, so you, so you have to keep going. Yeah, you, and you have to tell those stories. Even even if you're going to take personal blowback. Yeah, no, I I will, and I want feedback from people. So I've I've gotten so many, you so, know. All right, requests. so let's tell let's tell them where they go so they can read it and subscribe. Oh my God! What's the um, URL? I you know I should have the URL <laughs> memorized. Google Brooke Hammerling. It's Pop Culture Mondays on Medium. Okay, and I'm going to put, put links to everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, all right, <laughs> so people subscribe, and now I'm getting a URL soon. It's you'll get you'll get a custom. So now though, when you're in meetings, when you're talking to people who are maybe younger or hip or more online than you what? and some meme shit comes up like you're gonna know what's going on you might yeah. not you might not care that much about it but at least you won't be like it's that reference point you can just say I, I'm I totally in agree so I totally agree it's so important um and I I'm telling you it's like I've heard from very very big names in the financial world too CEOs who say I, it's the first time I've ever been able to have a conversation with my kids at the table where I Brooke, understand a, what's going Brooke, on. it's a new era. First of all, all the famous hedge fund managers are now divorced and dating. <laughs> and they're not dating their own age. Second they're of all, they're not dating girls the, my age. The CEO of Goldman Sachs is a DJ. <laughs> sure is. It's a new era that we're in. Yeah. So it's, it's important to be up to date on pop culture right. and you're helping. 45 and, is the new 25. All right, we love you. You'll come back? Yeah. Okay, and everyone's going to subscribe and let us know what your thoughts are on the video. Give us a like if you haven't. Subscribe if you haven't already. We will be back with you very soon.